and Dr. Larson is uh, the professor of preaching. He's written a book over a thousand pages on history of preaching, and uh, I believe you grew up in Southern California, didn't you? Minnesota. Minneapolis. Uh, Minnesota. Okay, Minneapolis. and then you went to California. Uh, that's right. Went to Fuller Seminary and uh, te- teaches at Trinity, and is a I think died in the wool uh, pre-tribber dispensationalist, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and his avocation you know is history, history of preaching and history of eschatology, and that's why we've uh, had him for the last couple of years to do historical topics, not just his excellent research that he's done. Uh, but also uh, the excellent presentation that he does. You know, some of us are droners, you know, who get up and read papers. Well, he's, uh, he's more dramatic, and he'll keep you awake. And he gets an occasional amen even during some of his uh, presentations. And uh, he wrote a book on the history of eschatology, that uh, did you bring any this year? No, I didn't. No, okay. That you can get, and it's one of the best out there. Uh, very extensive work on the history of eschatology, uh, uh, premillennialism, and all these kinds of things down through church history. And so we're happy to have Dr. Larson come and talk about the postmodern okay. abandonment of Israel. Thank you very much. Don't you appreciate this, Tommy Ice? What a gift he is to all of us. God bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. It has seemed to me that this conference has been especially helpful in our understanding the times as the men of Issachar understood their times and knew what Israel ought to do. We want to take seriously the expectation of our Lord that we interpret the signs of the times. It was interesting to me that Professor Gary Wills of Northwestern, as we came to Y2K and the year 2000, he said, you know, And he's not a believer. What we really have to understand is the broad scope of Christian eschatology. And he went on to say, you can't understand the history of the United States if you do not understand Bible prophecy. Gary Wills, Northwestern. The whole idea of predictive prophecy has always been under attack. I mean, from the beginning, Celsus, Porphyry. Fulfilled prophecy is too powerful and apologetic for Satan and his minions to tolerate it. The Enlightenment project was predicated on the notion that human progress is inevitable and that heaven is on earth and virtually reachable now through human genius. All kinds of prophetic futurism are mocked by the realized eschatologies of C.H. Dodd, N.T. Wright, Graham Goldsworthy, and the varied kinds of preterism. Contemporary evangelical aberrations like openness of God theology are engulfed by Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy and deny that God knows the future and like ourselves, is limited to projections of probability. The so-called emergent church movement is all over the map, but generally dismisses eschatology. In the book to which reference was made by our brother Brian McLaren's The Secret Message of Jesus, he's he's overtly pro-Palestinian. That's as much eschatology as is there. This is a splash at the shallow end of the pool. (laughs) The two-covenant idea regarding Jews in the church has always had some devotees, 
But now replacement theology or supersessionism is sweeping through evangelicalism like a plague of locusts. These are all more subtle or less subtle attacks on biblical supernaturalism, intended or unintended. Classical dispensationalism in its continuity with the early church's insistence on the imminent and premillennial return of Christ and its implicate a two-stage parousia. In those early centuries, they didn't draw out the implicate. Just as even Christologically, that did not form until Nicaea or Chalcedon. Soteriologically, it didn't really form until the Reformation. And it, it took centuries for, for the implicate to be drawn out of their deep conviction, the second coming is imminent and premillennial. But if it is imminent, if it could happen at any moment, there can be no sign. Premillennial involves signs. The implication clearly is a two-stage parousia. It's there. And the evangelical free church is at this very hour pondering the removal from its statement of faith of imminent and premillennial. Dear God, have mercy. <laughs> Classical dispensationalism has been built on the validity of predictive prophecy and an effort to maintain a consistent hermeneutic. The powers of the age to come have begun to break into this present evil age, Hebrews 6, 5. But history is moving in linear fashion toward what our Lord termed the consummation of the age, the omega point. Harold O.J. Brown argues incisively that J.A. Bengel's Württembergian pietism with its biblicism and its millennialism was a major force in combating the Enlightenment. B.H. Carroll of Southwestern Seminary maintained that premillennialists don't become modernists. The issues are drawn here and the stakes are high. Classical dispensationalism has championed the clear distinction between Israel and the church on exegetical, theological, historical, and logical grounds. This is more than asserting that God has something special for Israel at the end of the age, as any fool can plainly see, to use Lou Abner's vernacular. A millennialist like Augustine and Martin Lloyd-Jones conceded that. There will be something perking among the Jews at the end of the age. We mean more than that. Even the post-millennialist Charles Hodge conceded that Romans 11 could not be avoided. This is, this is not about the church. This is about ethnic Israel. You know, something's going to happen at the end of the age. But we believe that Scripture drives us to proclaim a distinct national and landed future for ethnic or geopolitical Israel at the end of the age, her rebuilding the temple, her conversion, and worldwide witness. In more recent years, a hydra-headed, many-pronged movement has arisen which would tear... Romans 11 and all relevant passages out of the scripture and with its mounting ascendancy and increasingly pervasive influence must be carefully examined and I would do so with you now with particular reference to postmodernism's abandonment of Israel. First of all, and briefly, the postmodern assault on truth. In my view, Postmodernism does incorporate key elements of Enlightenment rationalism, carrying them to a logical conclusion. Secularism, narcissism, relativism, pluralism, they're all there. But like Romanticism earlier, it has found the rationalism of modernism sterile and unsatisfying that it has lost confidence in human reason as sufficient has caused some premature elation among some among of us who celebrate postmodernism now. That's like rejoicing that Stalin won over Hitler. 
but one oppression and one tyranny are only replacing another. In jettisoning, jettisoning rationalism, now rationalism is naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> rationalism is an idolatrous worship of the sufficiency of the human mind to solve problems, all problems. That's rationalism. That, that, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but in jettisoning rationalism, POMO also throws overboard rationality. That's a good thing. It's an essential aspect of the Imago Dei, the image of God. If it weren't for rationality, this meeting is madness. We've got to have the law of contradiction. We've got to have logical categories to communicate. So rationality, we insist on. But they've overthrown rationality. In denying objective truth and any absolute moral values, POMO makes human beings simply social constructs. Postmodernism climaxes the Nietzschean crusade to banish God from human thought. Its denial of any universal truth is fatal. POMO denies objective history. There is no such reality as a worldview. There's no connecting of the dots. There's no overarching meta narrative, no remedies, no hope. And this creates an incredible quagmire. At the bottom line, POMO destroys text, and scripture then becomes like Aesop's fables. Reader response, in which the reader, in effect, becomes the author. Reader response is everything. There's no such thing as originality in literary deconstruction. There's no such category as plagiarism. No one knows what the author meant. <laughs> Some are taking advantage of that. <laughs> there is no such thing as bona fide inference in postmodernism. If you don't know what the author meant, you can make no inference from what the author says. And where would reasonable discourse and thought be without inference? POMO is presently the engine force driving change in our culture at the highest levels, and it is having a permeating effect. Yet beware, there still is enlightenment rationalism out there Modern science, one of England's leading men of letters, Sir Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, a bestseller in England and in this country. It's always been the case. Some have said Christianity is not true. What we're hearing today, it, in a huge gush of animosity and hostility, Christianity is evil. That's what's coming like a flood. Well, well, there still is Enlightenment rationalism. There still is New Age ideology, old-fashioned romanticism, post-World War II existentialism, and all kinds of isms and sisms and asms and spasms as far as that goes. <laughs> but I, I think it needs to be said, the average preacher is still preaching to 75% or more of the congregation who are still very much traditional learners. So don't become spastic in seminars on postmodernism. But we believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's the one that's got to communicate this truth to the heart. Whether it's the builders, the boomers, the busters, the bubbles, Generation X, millennials, the acoustically inclined, the visually inclined, the kinesthetically inclined. You can go nuts thinking about how can anyone understand the thing that I'm saying. But look, it's the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. He's in with and under the Word of God. But POMO is the trend. It is the tilt and the tendency enervating our culture. It's another log on the fire of infidelity. When implied or applied, it bears an immense impact on the validity of our claim for Israel's future. And that's why we've got to consider it today. I want to talk to you a little bit now about the truth we love. If, if, Homo is assaulting truth with a capital T. The truth we love, God's covenant fidelity to Israel. 
Our whole case for a distinctive future for ethnic Israel is based theologically on our view of the character of a covenant-keeping God and our commitment to historical grammatical exegesis and a concern for the human author's intention in the writing of divine revelation. In other words, God meant what he said. And both the judgments on Israel and the promised blessings are to be literally understood. Not only does the Old Testament commit to Israel's survival, but her eternal landedness and her sustained possession and prosperity and peace in that land, they are contingent on her obedience. The Deuteronomic covenant, Deuteronomy 28, is a conditional covenant. I think we must bear that in mind. Her return to the land, her conversion, her worldwide witness, this is part of our worldview. This is the big picture, the meta narrative. Neither John the Baptist nor the Lord Jesus redefined kingdom promise, nor did they transfer it, nor did they cancel it for Israel. Here is a worldview, and in the face of even the denial of, of the possibility of such a meta narrative, we can't surrender. Whatever or whenever alien ideologies have been propounded, our contextualization of the message cannot be a capitulation or an accommodation. Liberation theology maintained we had to accommodate Marxism. Where's Marxism today? We are steadfastly pre-modern and fault Rene Descartes and John Locke for making no appeal to supernatural revelation. Like Kant's denigration of the cognitive, this would sound the death knell for biblical faith and we would become apostate. Look at the evidence on which we stand. Jesus never countermanded or concluded the hope of Israel. In fact, he said he would save his people from their sin. In its strict contextual reference, that's a description of Israel. An ultimate evangelization by a remnant in the end time will take place going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Matthew 10.23. Is that landedness or is it not? If Israel is now the church, by the way, who is Ishmael? The promised future ministry of Elijah becomes critical, as the Lord Jesus indicates John the Baptist could be Elijah if they were willing to hear him. But in fact, John the Baptist had been rejected in the Elijah role, and the restoration of all things had then to be deferred. I don't see how we can make any sense out of these passages without the postponed kingdom concept, which has been commonly accepted among us. Let's hold on to it. I, I feel it slipping a little. This matter of the restoration, that is the theocratic kingdom and its deferral is a critical piece of evidence in our case. Later Jesus refers to the renewal of all things and how his apostles would sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So has God obliterated and superseded ethnic Israel? Here in the end, in the restoration, the twelve tribes of Israel, they're still here. He indicates that the Jewish temple would be left desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A future generation of Jews would see him again. He speaks to his listeners and by prophetic telescoping reaches forward to an end-time population. And in preaching on Simeon and Anna last Lord's Day in Wheaton, it gripped me anew. Anna spoke of the child to all in Jerusalem who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Poor dear old girl, she didn't know enough to come in out of the rain. There's no future for Jerusalem. Oh, yes, there is. And there will be a redemption of Jerusalem. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. You turn in the New Testament. 
Similarly, the Olivet Discourse has at points a distinctly Jewish cast, not on the Sabbath, and a testimony which the end-time Jewish remnant would render, preaching the gospel of the kingdom in all the world, and then the end would come. None other than Dr. Luke affirmed that Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Is that landedness or is it not? Jerusalem, it's the navel of the earth. I mean, it is still the center. The Jew is the key to history and prophecy. Something in the end time. At the judgment of the living nations at Christ's return in power and glory at issue will be the treatment of the least of these, my brethren, in the Great Tribulation. The book of Acts does not admit as the last word that Israel has failed. Indeed, the kingdom would be restored to Israel. And again, Christ would remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. The rebuilding of David's fallen tent and its restoration, Acts 15, will be effected in order that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. God called Jonah a second time. Romans 11 is a chair passage clearly showing that while the natural branches were cut off, God has not rejected his people. They will yet find restoration, which is life from the dead, clearly building on Ezekiel 36 and 37. The natural branches will be grafted into their own olive tree. Now, I'm a very simple person. And the plain, simple, natural meaning of this text, as I read it, they will be grafted into their own olive tree. This is not simply Jewish individuals baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Indeed, Israel's hardening in part as a nation will continue only until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved in a great final people movement to the Savior in fulfillment of the promised new covenant with God's ancient people. Now, Israel's distinctive identity is submerged in this church age. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And in the church age, all believers partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. And as such, beneficiaries, arrogance and condescension toward Israel are very unfitting and unbecoming. To state that the Jews have been cast upon the slag heap of history is not only Gentile arrogance, but it is to create a rat's nest of anti-Semitism. And that's wicked in the eyes of God. God's call to them is irrevocable. Do you believe that? I tell you, that's what it says. Irrevocable. How can you get over that? The natural branches are not made into wild olive branches. Ethnic identification is not altogether and forever superseded. Even in the face of the inclusive nature of the church in this age, there is the promise, Acts 26, 7, the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled. Interesting. And James writes to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Not once in the 54 references to Israel in the New Testament is the church called Israel. The point of reference in each case being ethnic Israel, even in Galatians 6.16, where Paul speaks of the Israel of God. I believe that's ethnic Israel. There is no reason this is not a reference to ethnic Israel, as are all of the other references. Fascinatingly, even in the gospel dispensation, Israel has a certain identifiable priority. The two references in Romans, Romans 1.16 and Romans 2.10, to the Jew first. Incomprehensible, unless Israel has a special status in the ongoing plan of God. And when John in the Apocalypse describes how every eye will see him in his coming and power and glory to set up his kingdom, 
All the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. But special mention is made of even those who pierced him. One seven. How could it be argued that God has rejected his people? By no means. In the book of Revelation, we have the saints of God in a number of passages, as you know, who are to be seen as Jews, who are saved in the tribulation, and Gentiles who are saved largely through their witness. The antecedent, which gives us the clue as to who are these saints in the tribulation period, the seven years, it seems to me must be Daniel 7. And the references here to the saints, the church was not known in Daniel 7. Who are these saints, the Jews to whom the kingdom is given? I do not believe the church is to be found on earth in the tribulation. The church age is detailed in, Rome, in Revelation 2 and 3. The 24 elders are in heaven. Chapters 4 and 5, Dr. Tenney, his great book interpreting Revelation. These 24 elders, who are they? They're not angels. These are are Old Testament saints and the church with crowns reigning with Christ. The true church which enters God's open door of service, 3.8, is promised extrication from the hour of trial and enters the open door of heaven. Thus the church as such is a non-factor on earth during the penultimate rebellion of the unholy trinity since the man of sin sets himself up to be worshipped in the temple which can only mean that a substantial restoration has taken place in the end. Landedness, a temple in which the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped. Israel has not disappeared or been absorbed in the church, but is a primary player and actor on the stage of tribulation trauma as described in Revelation. 144,000 are sealed from all the tribes of Israel. They're not the Seventh-day Adventists, or the elite of the Jehovah's Witnesses elect, or the church, as dear George Ladd and others have surmised. They are Jews, and the vanguard of all Israel that shall be saved. Through their witness, a great multitude comes out of the Great Tribulation from all the nations. The conversion of the 144,000, this vanguard, in my view, is described in 11, 1 to 13, where in response to the Elijah ministry of the two witnesses predicted in Malachi 4, there are converts. Inhabitants of Jerusalem give glory to God. 11, 13, that's repentance and conversion language. As represented in 14.1-5, the 144,000 are the first fruits of a great harvest. Chapter 12, Satan makes war against the woman who gives birth to a son. This woman is Israel. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The dragon, greatly enraged, makes war against the rest of her offspring. Who are her offspring? Her spiritual progeny, the saved Gentiles. Many of whom will be martyred because they will not take the mark of the beast. We must remember that Armageddon, which figures largely in the end time finale, is placed in the land promised to Abraham, the valley of Megiddo. Is there landedness or is there not? Armageddon. The new Jerusalem descending, home of the church, exists in relation to the earth, the home, the new earth, the home of restored Israel, and is suspended above the earth, in my view, like a gigantic space module. The new earth for the Jews. The new heaven, the new Jerusalem for the church. Even in the millennium and in eternity future, there will not be a fusion of Israel and the church. Yet, fascinatingly, on the gates of the new heaven are written the names of the twelve tribes. To the last page of Scripture, geopolitical Israel survives and thrives as an identifiable entity. No replacement theology or supersession here. And the reason for this is anchored in the very nature and character of God. As Malachi 3.6 states so lucidly, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. 
Ever since the time of your forefathers you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. And indeed they shall return physically to the land and spiritually to our Lord Jesus Christ. These truths are a rich corpus, precious to us as to many before, Joachim of Fiora, the Puritans, on both sides of the Atlantic, the continental pietists, they all saw this unique return to Eretz Israel at the end of the age to Lutherans like George Peters and J.A. Sace, to Presbyterians like James Brooks, Donald Gray Barnhouse, and James Montgomery Boyce, to Methodists like William E. Blackstone, to Congregationalists like C.I. Schofield and D.L. Moody, to Baptists like W.B. Riley, W.A. Criswell, and Adrian Rogers, to Plymouth Brothers like John Nelson Darby and Walter Scott, to Christian and Alliance missionaries, people like A.W. Tozer, Anglicans like Griffith Thomas, and on and on through that constellation of editors, teachers like Gabeline, Chafer, Wilbur Smith, and John Walward. Like every revealed truth in Holy Writ, this truth is under postmodern assault and denial. They would take away our Lord. That's what they do. And we must not and shall not give way. The fact is, our Lord Jesus Christ is alive, and he is going to win. Now, there is this assault, this fierce, frenzied assault. And an assault on our understanding of the biblical teaching on the restoration of Israel at the end of the age. Now I want to share with you a strategy for engagement with postmodernism. I don't want to just come up and fight. I want to win. We've got young people. I've got grandchildren that are sitting in college classrooms. And they're hearing a lot of drivel. I'm burdened. I'm concerned. A lot of gray hair. A lot of gray heads here. A lot of gray heads here. If the Lord should tarry, will the next generation, you know, pick up this torch of truth? I, I'm, I'm concerned. Beyond the faithful exposition of the truths of the blessed hope and God's purpose for his ancient covenant people, I'm going to offer some suggestions. And I tell you, I am more optimistic than I've ever been in 60 years of preaching. I'm interim pastor at the Wheaton Evangelical Free Church, and the elders asked me, give all of October and November to the preaching of Bible prophecy on Sunday mornings. We haven't had it for years and years and years. We haven't heard anything. I've just opened up. The attendance has gone up. People have been converted. Young people sit there taking notes. Listen, I'm very, very bullish I'm preaching Bible prophecy because it's part of the Word of God. Amen. Now, first of all, as God's people have withstood all kinds of spiritual assault, let's get a little perspective of history here in past ages. We're not going to be exempt from that, but if God be for us, who can be against us? As mainline denominations have apostatized in Europe and in North America, the fast-growing churches overseas... Let's take Anglicans in Africa or Nigeria specifically, which, if the Lord tarries in this next century, will reach a population of 500 million. Nigeria. And one of the prime movers in spiritual life in Nigeria, the, the Anglican church. And it's conservative. And it's biblical. And through their leaders, along with many others from Asia and Africa and Latin America, they are saying to the West, in your denial of Scripture, your radical feminism, and your espousal of the gay rights agenda and redefinition of the family, you are dying. Wake up. You know the tension in, in Anglicanism. Liberalism lost out by accommodating Enlightenment categories, and evangelicalism will lose out if it mistakenly supposes that cozying up to postmodernism and giving way is the answer. That's to court total disaster. 
we are falling into the same trap as the liberals fell into with respect to the Enlightenment. And in our case, it's postmodernism. We shall not win people to Christ by aping the culture which is in decadence and in a serious moral freefall. We must not be diverted from the Great Commission by secondary involvements which have validity and value, but which can consume our attention and our energy. I am all for address to the needs of the poor. Who has been at the forefront of that effort in rescue missions, in worldwide missions, in the Salvation Army, through all these decades. We, we've been there. And I'm concerned about issues in society and in the environment. But the current observable horizontalizing of evangelicals is undercutting the primacy of the supernatural gospel. The gospel is more than a cultural artifact. It is God's power for salvation. Friendship with the world is still enmity with God. We've got to be careful here. I have been immensely thrilled in reading David Aikman's Jesus in Beijing. The underground churches in the People's Republic of China are premillennial. Praise be to God. Listen, it shouldn't surprise us. It's biblical. <laughs> Two, systems come and go. We must not panic and become spastic before formidable adversaries. Anti-cognitive movements have arisen in history. In Greek philosophy, we have the cynics, the sophists, the pre-Socratics. But intermittently in the history of God's people, grave threats to the faith have arisen. Gertrude Himmelfarb has pointed out that already in Europe, we have post-post-modernism which faults today's postmodernism as not sufficiently activistic in social and justice issues. Listen, this, this thing is very fluid. This is very much in a ferment. This has not gelled yet. This has not congealed in any sense. 9-11 has been very hard on postmodernism. <gasps> Evil, or vice versa. No, that doesn't wash that way. <laughs> this really does seem evil. You see, this has been a crisis for postmodernism to grapple with a disaster like 9-11. They can't process this. The two-thirds world is not pomo. Heath White argues that postmodernism may mutate. Who can say what course all of this will take? Trying to get hold of postmodernism is like a hen trying to lay an egg on an escalator. You know, where's the target? It, it's all over the map. It's in so many varieties. What is it? Where is it? You know, it may well collapse under the weight of its studied ambiguity. Such subjectivity quickly lands you on the reefs and shoals of nihilism, something without hope. What does this say to people tormented and troubled and torn in the vicissitudes of modern life? The cupboard is empty. Three, postmodernism has nothing to say to anti-Semitism. One of the most virulent tools which Satan has used, Stanley Fish, it's a name we know well in Chicago, Provost of the University of Illinois, Chicago campus for many years, left in a huff last year. One of the doyens of postmodernism was on the Larry King live show. Larry asked him, do you believe that the Holocaust was evil? He stuttered and stammered and would not commit himself. Well, come on now, Larry said. Was the Holocaust evil? Well, I wouldn't have done it myself. <laughs> but can people live in this suspended animation indefinitely? I mean, how practical is this? Even Fish, 
in publishing his new book on John Milton, opined, he hoped people would now finally understand what John Milton really meant. When they write books themselves, they want us to understand what they mean. Richard Rorty, from my old alma mater, just retired from Stanford, fascinatingly, as he's reached 70, he says, I think I'm going to live the rest of my life by the golden rule and the second half of the Decalogue. He had no moorings. He was at sea. He grasped for something. How many of these pomos will be grasping and gasping? Pomo is an unsatisfactory solution. It's flawed and flat. This quintessential moral relativism is, in fact, incoherent. It is nonsense. And it is doomed, although it may inflict incredible damage before it collapses. Fourthly, I'm going to say it. We must beware of prophetic overreach. We're going to make a strong case. We've got the case to make. Our case is vertically consistent. And it horizontally fits the facts. The two criteria, it seems to me, for an acceptable worldview. But let us be cautious in claiming too much, too fast, beyond what Scripture really says. Greater Israel, as promised to Abram, from the great river of Egypt to the Euphrates, on the facade of the Knesset in Jerusalem given by the Rothschilds, as you know. It's millennial in its ultimate scope. Land for peace is dangerous in my view. But it was Menachem Begin who negotiated the return of the Sinai to Egypt. And Sharon and Olmert, they're not from labor. They're originally from Likud and the Harut. They're conservatives, uh, right-wing politicians in Israel. You know, they're, they're the ones that made the concessions. Abraham, although promised the land, insisted on paying the Hittites for the burial place of Sarah. There was a recognition it's been promised to us in perpetuity, forever, a possession. But its occupancy and our prosperity and peace in that land are contingent for God's time. A defensible Israel is in everyone's best interests. Petropolitics and the growth of the Muslim population in the West jeopardizes backing for Israel increasingly in our own country. And don't doubt for a minute that Israel is in the mix in Iraq and the issues which we face there. Yet Islamofascism is terrifying many thoughtful people around the world. Israeli politics are complex and intricate. We, we must be careful about asserting that Hurricane Katrina was God's punishment on the United States for pressing pressuring Israel on Gaza. Let's, let's be careful there. Israel was divided itself. I mean, the people were not of one mind on the Gaza issue. Sharon went through every hoop. He won every voting round for his policy. We must not be like the friends of Job who were so cocksure. They knew why Job suffered. Pat Robertson said that God sent the stroke on Sharon because he gave away Gaza. How does he know that? Woodrow Wilson also had a serious stroke after backing the Balfour Declaration in 1917. What then was the meaning of tsunami or of the Pakistani earthquake which killed 75,000 in a country which had gone out on a limb to cooperate with the United States when that had not been all that popular? How finally can we ascribe causation to natural disasters? Can we infallibly read the mind of God in dialoguing with students, inundated with pomo propaganda, and under great pressure we should heed Peter's words be always ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. 
so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. There, there's a tone and a mood which we need, which is not always argumentative, but which on occasion is winsome. I've been reflecting on the recent fulminations of the formerly conservative Kevin Phillips in a recent book. <laughs> he argues one-third of America now believes in the rapture. Would God that it were true. <laughs> and they provide the power base which is pushing American foreign policy in the Middle East. A bit overstated, but of considerable interest. Let us beware of prophetic overreach. In what lies ahead, as I see it, Israel will need faithful friends. This does not mean endorsement of everything Israel does any more than a patriotic American necessarily endorses everything our government does. She too can egregiously miscalculate, as the recent military action in Lebanon made abundantly clear. We grossly miscalculated in Iraq as to what would happen after the invasion. The insurgency, who saw it? Who saw the terrorists from Syria and Iran? Who saw Al-Qaeda's involvement? I mean, there was some miscalculation there. The Rumsfeld memo leaked this week would indicate it clearly. And Israel miscalculated this summer. They are in some disarray right now. I mean, militarily, they, there is a deep discomfiture in Israel. They didn't get the two soldiers back. They didn't get the one back in the Gaza. And Hezbollah has been aroused and infuriated, and now Lebanon is destabilized again. There was some miscalculation here. Not, not, not everything they do is shrewd and wise. I think that's a reasonable attitude that commends us to thoughtful people. Not to have to argue that everything... There will be dark days ahead for Israel and her friends. But remember, in the whole divestiture, divestiture, discussion and debate, when mainline denominations have voted to divest, the United Presbyterian Church backed down from that policy by vote of its General Assembly this last June. I mean, look. God is at work in remarkable ways. Now, fifthly, without remedies or hope, postmodernistic camp followers may be susceptible to the proclamation of hope, which we have in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the second advent of our blessed Lord. People cannot live with hope very long. Do you know that even rats need hope? Yes, they do. Experiments are short. You put rats in a huge vat of water. Rats will be able to swim for about 10 minutes. They give up and drown. Now, if you take a sample of swimming rats in the 10 minutes and put the sample on a shelf, give them a 10-minute break, Return them to the water, and they will swim 18 more minutes. The little rat got hope. I may be lifted as a rat out of the vat. Do you see that? We preach faith. We preach love. I'm asking ministerial gatherings around this country and abroad, why aren't we preaching more hope? The blessed hope. Preaching Magazine has been in business for about 25 years. I said to the editor, look, there hasn't been a single article on eschatology in 25 years. He will publish my major article in the next issue, Why Not Preach Bible Prophecy? I'm encouraged. Listen. 
Gallup and others show 62% of the American people say they believe in the second coming. Look, we've got, a, we've got a foot in the door. We're almost all the way in. They know nothing about the second coming, many of them. I mean, they don't know beans from buckshot. You know, literally the difference between their head and a hole in the ground. But I mean, look, I say there's an open door here. These people want hope. Why do so many people buy Tim LaHaye's left behind? 42% believe Christ could come back in their lifetime. Since Pomos are allergic to history and to meta narrative, we have something to offer. I've got a strategy here. Heath White reminds us that for pre moderns, that's who we are, texts have meaning. For moderns, texts have multiple meanings. For postmoderns, texts have no meanings. Well, what do they value? What kind of an engine can we ride in reaching out to POMOs? Literature is their master discipline. They love word games. Metaphor. Although their literary deconstruction utterly macerates text. Let us tell the story of a small but ancient people. I've tried this. I've been trying this lately in some selected audiences, particularly of college students, high school students, even junior high. Jesus told some stories. There's nothing immoral about telling a story, you know. I mean, narrative theology is for the birds, but look, there is narrative in Holy Scripture. And the story of this ancient people is one of the most intriguing and fascinating and gripping narratives in the history of this planet. This ancient people, let us share their age-long hope of returning to their homeland, something of the agonies and suffering of their pilgrimage. Let's bring out Fiddler on the Roof again. Anatevka, Anatevka. The pogroms of Russia. Listen, the sufferings of this people. Where do we get the word ghetto? From Venice. Ghetto was the Italian word for the place where the Jews were consigned. Listen, there's a story here to be told that reasonable and thoughtful and compassionate people may perk up their ears to hear. Narrative never establishes truth. You don't build doctrine out of narrative. Narrative illustrates truth. But the story can be the hook. Let's find occasions with young and old to tell the story of God's ancient and dispersed people, of their new homeland, their struggles. The Gulf Stream is not overcome by the ocean. So the Jews have remained distinct and apart, and so they will always be. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees... The moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. And only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. I am a confessed optimist. That's what I am. I'm a short-range pessimist with respect to the human endeavor. But I'm a long-range optimist because of Jesus. I do not believe we're going to save our culture or transform our world. Tikkun olam, or fixing the world, is not on God's agenda in this age as I understand it. The tares and the wheat grow together until the end. Few there be who find it. God wants people to be saved, including the Pomo imprisoned. And we have a hope, a hope that will never disappoint, a hope for Israel, a hope for the church, a hope for this old planet, the hope of eternal life, the blessed hope of Christ's translation of his bridal church. Let's sound this message of hope in an increasingly hopeless age. My sweetie and I, 50 years married now, as we think of our children and our grandchildren and the whole broad outreach of our concern, and we feel the onslaughts, but our motto is 
increasingly. Chin up, knees down. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Any um, comments? <laughs> yes. One que question. Questions? Right here, Tommy. Okay. Can I? Right here. Oh, go ahead. Can I just say? Um, I think one thing that I've noticed that might help too is when we use the word enlightenment, and you had her name up here, Gertrude Himmelfarb has a great book showing that when we use the word enlightenment as Christians, we usually refer to the French enlightenment, which was an atheistic enlightenment. But there are two other enlightenments. One was the British Enlightenment, which was not atheistic but theistic. And the other was the American Enlightenment, which was also a theistic enlightenment. And therefore, we should, we should slant away from the French Enlightenment with the, with, the, uh, with the Desades of the world and the Voltaires of the world and all the rest of that group and slant more towards the British Enlightenment and we would be much better off in our argument on the, on the modern and postmodern issue, I think. That's just an observation. Yes, and I, I, I would agree, David. And Himmelfarb is exceptionally insightful on so many issues. For instance, on the whole distortion of what Victorian England was, if you're interested in the days to which Spurgeon spoke and, and, and the influence of the gospel. But I, on the Enlightenment, she's, she's very, very good. Although I think one has to say overall the, the Enlightenment project from the fall of the French Bastille to the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989, that, that period was a general turn toward reason as the key to all. And uh, even John Locke said he was a Christian but made no real appeal to supernatural revelation. And uh, our own forefathers were very mixed spiritually, as we know. Good point. Wasn't that said in Britain to be a romantic enlightenment? Or it's dominated by romanticism as opposed to pessimism in the French? Yeah, and all that. See, and that's when dispensational eschatology came on the scene. And, and that's what the historians are saying, that uh, dispensa systematic dispensationalism is simply a product of the roman British Romantic Enlightenment. Uh, you know, when they get more sophisticated in their um, Scottish common sense or rationalistic arguments which w with which they dismiss our view. But and you in your book on the history of dispensationalism, you're going to show us that's eyewash. I didn't know I was writing a book on well, that. Well, I, th I thought I heard reference to a book you're writing on dispen history dispensation. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was, my, maybe, maybe it's coming. Maybe you're a prophet and don't know it. <laughs> just one follow-up on that, just one follow-up on that is uh, Wilberforce and Darby and that group were all in the same time se sequence, too, and they were influenced by the English part of it. Burke, for example, exposed the French Revolution and the French thinkers. Right. So I think we have some we have some pieces there that we should look at carefully, and, and, and instead of just using the word enlightenment is what I'm saying, and yeah. then we all of, all of a sudden we translate that into the French enlightenment. I think that's a mistake. And the the romantics like Coleridge and Wordsworth, of course, were first very much drawn to the French Revolution, but then they revulsed when they saw its violence. But neither Coleridge nor Wordsworth was a believer. You know, there was a, a kind of vague pantheism there, God in nature everywhere. Yes. Yeah, and, and at the same time, these very people uh, who say that about our origins uh, say that we have a pessimistic eschatology. So how can we come out of this uh, romantic time? I guess maybe that's the French reaction or something. I don't know. Dr. Larson, you mentioned... Uh you're experimenting with young people in storytelling, which I find very compelling. Jewish people love to tell stories, and it's very much part of our background. Can you tell us the result? What you actually summarize what you did, and then 
I'd really be interested in what the reaction was of whether it's junior high, high school, or college. What kind of things did you find after you told the story? Yes. Well, I abandon a systematic exposition of a didactic text very reluctantly in any preaching or communications opportunity. Uh, but on occasion, such as I have described, an opportunity presents itself for me to give a, a more panoramic, a little feel for the big story, the meta-narrative here. Because sometimes we're so in the trees of the forest, we don't see the larger picture. And um, so what I've done, even with junior high, senior high, college students in a varsity group, you know, uh, just with my Bible in my hand and, and anchoring in, in a couple of key verses as I proceed, just share the promises of God to this people. And, you know, make it very clear that the return of 42,000 exiles as described in the book of Ezra is, is not the fulfillment of the great promises of return and restoration. In fact, after the remnant got back in the return from the exile, Zechariah 10 talks about a future worldwide restoration. You know, I'll, I'll go into things like that. But, and then, you know, I'll get into, you know, the rise of Zionism and the Dreyfus affair with uh, Theodor Herzl in Paris and uh, World War I and the Balfour Declaration and how all of these great generals, uh, whether you have Ord Wingate, whether you've got Allenby, you've got uh, Chinese Gordon, uh, Gordon of Khartoum, they were all believers. They, they, they were raised to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I mean, God had the right people at the right place in the right time. God is working things out. You see, it's this, it's this connected thread that uh, is so bare and empty in postmodernism. There's no connection. There's no, uh, you know, finishing the dots together. And um, I have found, you know, some very positive response. Uh, some are not that interested, but some are drawn in by, by the wonder and the beauty of uh, what our God has done, is doing, and will... What's next? What's next? We're, we're just right off the, the newspaper and the newscast and the internet, you know, on, on the issues. What's in store for Israel? Will they survive? You know, what, what, what is going to happen? Yes, I, I've had very positive results, Steve. With This isn't the only thing I do with this issue, but it's one thing that I have found bridges to a more POMO-influenced group. Yeah, you know, I found people really respond to pointing out, uh, for example, how apparently God uh, brought the cussing Baptist to Harry Truman in at the right time. Talk about a dramatic story uh, when you compare FDR and what he apparently would have done uh, if he had been in office when the state of Israel was, you know, and that's a good 30-minute story to well, ex get all the... Exactly, and with the State Department, always against anything favorable uh, to uh, Israel. Uh, but there was Eddie Jacobson in Kansas City, who'd been in partnership with Harry S. Truman in the haberdashery business. And Eddie got a call from Kaim Weitzman, you know, and... Uh, and you've got to influence your president. I mean, who could have who could have moved? Harry Truman was a fairly adamantine type, you know. He had a mind of his own, and Eddie Jacobson got to him. God is at work. He and here came recognition in 1948. Bingo, like that. State Department or no State Department, right. blah. <laughs> um, what about typology? In other words. I find it compelling to go, you know, the conversion of Israel and, and Joseph weeping with his brothers, you know, uh, how do you use that? Uh, and how do you find response to that kind of stuff? In other words, after you've taught something, you come back in and punctuate it with uh, the typological illustrations from the Old Testament. Yes. Biblical illiteracy is running against us 
in that use of Old Testament materials. You can't even assume that your deacons and elders know, you know, the content of Scripture as we did at one time. When unlearned and uneducated people, they knew two books, the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress, my own grandparents. I mean, they knew those books and argued theology and the doctrines of the atonement at, at the dinner table. Night after night, I can still hear them. Uh, <laughs> And I, I would want to use typology lightly. I, are you into Gapelt and, and, and his study of biblical typology? And you know, there's been a little uh, renaissance of interest in typology, and there's a legitimacy to a kind of typology. And uh, I'd want to go a little lightly, but I have been known to indulge. Uh, for instance, here is Jonah. And God says, go to the Gentiles and preach. And he wouldn't go, and he didn't want to go. And, and there was a loss of missionary vision here. Uh, to be a witness to the Gentiles was not very appealing, especially when your real desire was for the Ninevites, ash in a flash, you know. And uh, so Jonah was thrown into the sea. I mean, I, I'm, I'm into indulging the sea, the nation. I mean, this is, isn't this Revelation 17, the nations, the Yeah, sea. I was just thinking, Absolutely. I was saying the same thing. Yeah, That's right, and, and, and the, great, the great fish swallow Jonah. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. And he's not absorbed. I mean, here is the unique... Oh, am I, am I doing something terrible here? This is illustration now. This is not, you know, interpretation. I've preached through Jonah five times. You're, you're a preaching professor. Well, no, that's right. Liberties. I mean, I'm just using this as an illustration. And, and then he's vomited out on the dry land. And the word of God comes to Jonah a second time. Go and preach. And listen, when the, when the word comes a second time to the Jewish remnant, they will go and preach to the Gentiles. And there's going to be a great... A great movement of God, I believe, in the seven years, the tribulation. A great, it, isn't it just like God to save people in every period of time? Tribulation, millennium, Old Testament, New Testament. I believe God's not willing that any should perish. Uh, don't you think, though, that the overall postmodern disposition is, uh, for some reason, to be pro-Palestinian? And well, know, the I left... Think the left in Europe, the left in the United States, you know, what, what do you see about postmodernism that, that they all seem to hate Israel with a passion? It's not, you know, passive no. hatred or neglect. It's, it's a, in fact, I remember this summer um, during the war, I, I, I can't remember what network it was on, uh, whether it's Fox or whatever, they were interviewing an Israeli lady up in the north part of the country, and she said, you know, she was clearly a secular Jewish lady, and she said, no matter what we do, every year they hate us more. Very frustrated. No. Well, I just think you have to see anti-Semitism as one of the primary tools of the devil. The hatred of the Jews, the hatred of the Messiah who came from Israel, the hatred of the book which was given us by the Jews, uh, with the exception of Dr. Luke, and uh, it, it is the most persistent and vile of all prejudices, and it is very deep dyed, and it's very common among intellectuals. G.K. Chesterton, T.S. Eliot, I mean Charles Lindbergh, Henry Ford. Vicious anti-Semites, all of them. You know, this, this is just a dreadful exposure of how human beings will buy into Satan's lying. And um, large British fraternities of professors will participate in no international conference where Israeli scholars are present. Because this is apartheid. This is the new line, you know, of, of the racism uh, of the state of Israel, although... Everybody's building walls somewhere or other. In fact, we're building one ourselves, I think, uh, uh, down on one of the border lines. We, we hope. Yes. But uh, apartheid. But um, I think uh, the Swedish military would not participate in any military uh, NATO exercise uh, which would include the Jews uh, Israel, the Israeli Navy, uh, a very important part of, of the Eastern Mediterranean, because of, of the way Israel was treating the Palestinians, you know, that very selectivity uh, in uh, terrorism. Uh, ever heard of a Jewish suicide bomber? Very interesting. But this is anti-Semitism, and it is so evil. It is so evil.
and, and it's endemic. And there's a country club anti-Semitism, which is not far from the surface in our own country. Right. But it seems, for example, old liberalism mm -hmm. had its filio-Semites, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, around World War I and between World War II. It seems no one on the left anymore. No. That's no right. one. It, it, uh, Reinhold that, Niebuhr stood for the state of Israel right. at Union Seminary. There is no one standing for Israel. Right. It, you know, it, it, the Christian century was, has been anti-Israel from the beginning. And that's one of the reasons Reine established his own Christianity in Crisis magazine. Because he said, you're too doctrinaire. In your anti they, they even were Holocaust deniers for an extended period of time. That, that's liberalism, you know. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, I'll meet you halfway. Yes, thank you, Dr. Larson. I want to ask a question pertaining to your statement about not going too far. Yes. As, um, you know, the, the nation uh, Gaza has been given back, and, you know, some would argue, well, they can't, you know, they're a nation, they can't get back. When, when do we draw the line? You know, the way I see it, they can't be totally dispersed again because there's no biblical case for a third you know, for another restoration into the land so at what point do you see that God will draw a line and if he doesn't draw a line and Ahmadinejad accomplishes his goal in the United Nations plan to move the Jews to Arizona or the Baja of California is accomplished would we where would we where would that put us let's say the world accomplishes their desire to remove the state of Israel where would that put us, and do you think the line is, are we being too extreme to say they cannot be removed from the land? Well, I do not think Israel will be removed from the land. They're in a very precarious position. But it seems to me a bit presumptuous for us to say for Israel or for God where that line is to be, you know. And uh, I think that already Olmert has, be, ha, has gotten cold feet on some of his earlier promises and intimations with regard to some of the settlements. I think that's, that's an issue that, that's been laid aside now because of the, of the critical nature of the threat for Israel. I think it's very, you see, feeling that the ultimate possession will be millennial. Uh, remember that of the British mandate, four-fifths of the mandate in 1922 was given to form the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the whole East Bank, you know. So there was a, that was engineered by Winston Churchill, who was himself a very professed Zionist in his thinking until the King David Hotel explosion. Then, then Churchill became um, a bit angry. Uh, but, um, you know, my, my feeling would be, brother, that... It's very difficult for us to say where that line is. A defensible Israel, what is it? Um, you know, what are we to do in this critical situation right now? Are, are, we, are we saying that the answer is to nuke Iran? A preemptive strike? Now that worked in 1981 for Israel with respect to Iraq. But the situation, as I read it, is very much different in Iran. Very dispersed sites, deeply buried sites. Uh, you know, we heard those voices in uh, the Cold War. We need a preemptive strike. And we should destroy the Soviet Union before they destroy us. Now, you know, maybe Jesus will come before any of this is problematic. But um, you know the balance of terror. I don't think the American people are predisposed to, to use thermonuclear weaponry a second time since we are the only nation that has ever used it and used it the first time. And I think the election in uh, November was a definite step back with respect to even implication uh, in Iraq. Uh, big issues there. So I, I'm not sure Nukem is the answer. Uh, I, I knew, but but I, what Israel decides to do, you know. I'd nuke Mecca first. 
Then I would advise all missionaries from the North Africa mission to return to the United States. <laughs> You're right. Well, thank you, Dr. Larson. My pleasure. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>